A lot of folks are out with their uh, kids or grandkids collecting Reformation candy. <laughs> so, all right, let's open in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together in fellowship and to take a look at your word. And we just pray for wisdom and understanding and that you give us some insight into your word. And as we start getting into the warnings to the churches, um, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to see where our own personal shortcomings are and also our um, our blessings are too lord that you have for us um, as you make all kinds of promises to your people about what we'll get in glory and this is what we're all looking for because um, this world is is about done and you know we're ready to stick a fork in it because it is done it's just so evil lord and we it grieves us so much we just want to see jesus and lord we pray that you would uh, give us insight into all that and give us um blessed hope this evening for it's in christ's name we pray and give you thanks amen all right so this is really this is the third session um last week's session sorry it's not available online because the audio just did not turn out at all and what's going on so hopefully it's working right this week and we'll get some good audio i've actually got two sources of audio going on right now so if one doesn't work maybe the other one will so, Really, this is kind of the third session. We didn't get too far in Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> but um, I kind of erased the scribbles off this whiteboard. We'll just keep adding to it, and then I kind of rewrote it. Um, again, we covered how Revelation um, is the apocalypse or apocalypsis, and it just means the unveiling. So unlike what they try to tell you in the movies and things like that when you say, oh no, it's the apocalypse, like it's some great disaster film or something like that. Apocalypse means the unveiling. It's and So it's the revealing of Jesus Christ. So this is why we kind of eschew the whole um, position that many reformed, particularly all, all millennial type people will try to do in saying that, well, the book of Revelation is written in apocalyptic language. Well, we'll... I'm going to say we'll agree it is, but apocalyptic language means revealing. It doesn't mean the obfuscation of Jesus Christ through all kinds of figurative language. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ, and that's what we get excited about, right? I mean, I'm ready to see Jesus revealed in the clouds. So, um, so chapter 1. Now, what I've also done, too, you see this little table here in the middle of the room with a bunch of books on it. And feel free to grab one and, and swap it out with other ones and pass it around. One of the things I want to do here um, is get everybody acquainted and comfortable with real world book type situations, some different types of reference books that you would use to test what, what I say, what anybody else says, like in the book of Acts, um, about being like the Berean, where Paul went to Berea and he's preaching there and they went to the scriptures to confirm everything that he said. So you never take everything that I say at face value. Um, you you might, because you know me, you might trust but verify, as Reagan used to say. So anything I, I say, I can be wrong. So you go into the scriptures and you verify some of that stuff and um, test it all with the scriptures. So there you have your reference books. Uh, another word, but another phrase besides authorial intent is the word synthesis. And I bring this up a lot that people... Forget this, or, or they've got a mindset where, well, you got the Old Testament and you got the New Testament. And the Old Testament God is different from the New Testament God. No, 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 it's all the same God. Wrote it all. He's the author of all, right? And somehow, the dichotomy is, though, is that you know, there's over 40 writers that are also authors. Somehow their personalities were permitted to come through with divine God-breathed scripture so it's perfect, but that took some divine intervention to make that happen that way. So synthesis is that the same author is the author of all, so he's not going to contradict himself. So if you come to a place and there's a big, huge contradiction, then guess what? It might be you or God might be making a point. All this to say is we've been s s stressing over and over, and I'm going to keep stressing this, it's just 
try to read, the, the book of Revelation can be so intimidating, but just try to read it normally like you would another book. Um, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. A lot of people say, no, it doesn't. Um, but there are reasons for trying to restructure the book of Revelation is because they'll say it's apocalyptic language, it's all symbolic, and we've got to put it in a blender and whatever and sort it out and make it come out this way so it says this. And again, as I've been saying, it's a huge logic flaw is that who gets to decide then what the symbolism means? If it's all figurative language, who gets to decide the order and, and how you understand it? So you paint yourself into the proverbial corner that way. And it just, it says what it means and it means what it says. As we mentioned last week, um, you guys are going to get tired of me saying this, but we look for words like like or as. Um, I'll write it here, like and as, okay? And because I said it last week, not all of you were here, but I said it last week, so what's an example of how like is going to illustrate symbolic language? Anybody remember or think of one? Like is hair. Hair like wool. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, tongue as a sword. That type of a thing. So you can look for keywords like that that might, are sometimes keys to trigger in your mind that he's giving, uh, he's using symbolic language. So symbolic language does happen in the Bible, but like most writings, I, I think it's clear where we can tell it should be symbolic. Okay, so without further ado, um, I know you're saying too late. Let's pick it up in verse 12, okay, of chapter 1. And so here's John. And he has this vision, he hears this voice, and he turns around. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. So there's that word like. So, so very good. Laura gets an A for that because they use her word like several times. Okay. So note the lampstands there on Patmos, Patmos um, with John and his vision. Um, they're gold because gold is precious. So this is the way Christ looks. And this is symbolic language. I mean, Jesus might have actually been walking among lampstands, but he's Somehow, in John's mind, he's painting an illustration, right? So he's showing that that uh, these lampstands are precious. Um, and you read the rest all the way down, and he describes them as churches. Um, but let's look at verse 13, though. Verse 13 describes a priestly garment. Um, kings, priests, prophets wore such robes. Uh, the sash, the... The priests in the Old Testament wore on their chest a little above the armpits a sash. And you can see examples of that in uh, Exodus. If you want to write it down, look it up sometime. Exodus 28 and 29 and also 39. Um, Leviticus 16 speaks of it. Okay, so those are four passages. So we would expect to see that where the priesthood is introduced and inaugurated and so forth. And so we do. And I believe we see the Lord Jesus in his priestly robe here, acting as the royal high priest on behalf of the church. And this is what he's illustrating to John. Um, Hebrews 2.17, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is one of those big $3 words. What does it mean? Substitute. Substitute. I looked up the word propitiation one time in the dictionary. Flipped to it, found it. Propitiation. That which propitiates. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That wasn't helpful at all. Verse 14. Um, where it says the hairs of his head. So 
not a flat white like an old person. His head and his hair were like wool or like snow. Um, that's an obvious reference there to Daniel 7, 9. Daniel 7, 9 says, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took a seat. Um, his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. What is white often? Did you say Daniel what? Daniel 7, 9. What does white often mean telling us in the Bible when it talks about pure. purity, right, pure. But the, the difference, the interesting thing, though, is in Daniel 7, 9, it's describing God. It doesn't mention anything about um, the Son of Man or the Son of God or anything like that, any of those titles for Jesus. It's describing God, so it's interesting that we see Jesus speaking to him, and if you have a red letter edition, it's written in red, but the description from Daniel 7, 9 is speaking of Yahweh. So here it's describing Christ. It's a marvelous par parallel, that is, to indicate again to us that Jesus Christ is in fact God. We went into that a little bit last week when we talked about the Alpha and the, and the Omega, the Almighty, right? The first and the last. Names shared with Yahweh. So um, the word white, it, it also means the word blazing. So it's not a flat color, so it's probably more shimmering or blazing, glowing white light. It might be like, uh, as we described before, Moses was exposed to the glory, Shekinah glory of God, and he came down from the mountain, and he was shimmering white, and he had to veil his face because people were, you know, blinded by his visage. So it might be, it might be like that. Um, so it shows his holiness. It demonstrates his purity of life. Um, his purity and truth. So he's wise and he's holy. He's blazing, glowing, brilliant, shining light. So um, that might also hearken to, to your memory. The uh, Jesus, when he was at the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember that? He was there with his, some of his disciples. Next thing you know, he went up and he was seen with who? Moses and Elijah, that's right. And Jesus, his whole visage was changed at that point, was different. So similar there. So it seems like whenever we're getting this uh, heavenly, unearthly veiled, true depiction of Jesus in some physical form, he comes across that way, glowing, dressed in white and purity. His eyes... Um, in, uh, in chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 18, the Son of God there was also seen with eyes like a flame of fire. So, penetrating eyes, right? Penetrating um, in to see the church. Uh, it's kind of creepy if you're nighttime and you're going through the hallway and you have a little bit of light and the cat or the dog's at the end of the lights and you just see two penetrating glowing eyes down at the end of the hallway. It's kind of creepy. Well, this is... Same kind of thing. You feel like it's looking into your soul, you know. And so we have uh, penetrating eyes to see the church. We see the same thing in uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 12. So those gazing, penetrating, supernatural lasers that penetrate right through the, with holy intelligence to reveal everything that he wants us to see, or that he wants to see. Um, so... Let's look at seven of these features just real quick here in chapter one. So his hair and his head, similar to Daniel 7, 9. That's the first one. The second one, let's look at, and I've got some verses that you can put next to it, and you can look these up later. Aside from his hair, we also have his eyes. And we also see that in Hebrews 1, 13 and 4, 13, and also about them a flame of fire. And the, the flame of fire we can see in 1 Corinthians 3.13 and Mal, Malachi 3.2. Um, a third one is feet, so the, the symbol of walk. You see Jesus walking among the lampstands, right? So he's moving among, among them. But we also see brass, which is judgment, like the brazen serpent, Numbers 21. Remember the serpent that was put up on the pole. Um, that's one such example. Um... We also see in this chapter that his voice, his voice is like many waters or like a waterfall. 
Um, you can see that in Ezekiel 1.24 and Ezekiel 43.2. Also Daniel 10, Daniel 10.6. Um, we'll also see that in his right hand were seven stars. Or we also have lampstands in the midst in his hand. And then we also see, um, these, so these are all anthropomorphisms of how the Lord deals with us and the way he's demonstrating himself in physical ways to communi communicate to us things about himself. Mouth is the sixth one. Out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. And some verses for that would be like Hebrews 4.12, Ephesians 6.17, and Isaiah 49.2. You have all those? Okay, um, it judges the unbeliever, his mouth, and that's in John 12, 48. <clears throat> um, and through that, his, the earth is smitten in Isaiah 11, 4. And also the Antichrist is consumed in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then you have generally his, <clears throat> his countenance, which means his face, usually, um, like the sun. And that we'd find that in uh, Matthew 17. Okay, so we'll go on here. So again, um, continuing on through this, as we read, as we described just now, his feet were like burnished bronze, uh, refined in a furnace, and so there's purity there, the heat, the high heat, and so forth, right? And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. So, uh, you don't want to try that too long, do you? You know, you can. we already know that you can become permanently blinded if you stare at the sun for a prolonged period. Um, but burnished bronze, you know, it's caused to glow in a furnace. And so... Um, you look at that, and the heat's raised, and that's what it's made to symbolize is judgment. So all of the, the temple and all the tabernacle furniture that was in any way used in a sin offering was always brass in the Bible. And so when you see brass in this situation, you know it, it has something to do with sin and uh, the purification of it. Here you, you have feet glowing hot, very clear reference to judgment. So anytime anybody came before the king, the king always, in ancient times, sat on an elevated throne. And when a criminal came in to be sentenced, he was always below the feet of the king. So he'd be looking down, and he kind of looked there, and there's his feet right there. Uh, he'd come down, and he'd look up at the feet, and, the, and then the throne, and the body, and then the head. So the feet of the king became the symbol of his authority. And here we find Jesus Christ with red-hot feet moving through moving through his church to exercise his chastening authority. So he's walking among the church and he's judging and he's uh, chastening. He's like a disciplining father for those who are believers, right? So it's blazing, molten, pure, refined, gleaming feet of judgment. And this is what God does in a different way among his own children than in the world where he's, his judgment is more permanent. And it's not chastening for a loving discipline. So again, the voice like uh, Ezekiel 43, 43, 2. That verse says, And behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the way of, of the um, beast, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So it's the, it's the voice of authority that we're seeing here, and that's what we're meant to see. Um, let me see if I can get this. I lost, I lost me cursor for some reason. Here we go. <clears throat> Maybe not. All right, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, what it means by angels, um, some people will try to... Th think that it means that there are actual angels, that each church maybe has an angel overseeing it. And that, yeah, it might be true. It might be more than one angel per church, really. We find that there are guardian angels and so forth. 
But um, the way that describes them and what they do, it doesn't come across as, as um, angels. Um, so what these angels are is messengers, and, and that's what the Greek tells us. So these are, and, and God doesn't have to communicate something to these angels because these angels have no direct authority over the church or can make any changes or um, offer direction to the church at all. They are angels, so it's not like they are uh, are going to come in and, and talk to the pastor or talk to the people or whatever. So when Jesus is communicating to these seven churches or, or the seven angels or messengers of the churches, um, he is writing seven letters to these seven messengers at these churches. And in chapters two and three, we have those actual letters. Um but what he does is in these seven churches, in these seven letters, is uh, first of all, I want to mention, as I have before, that these seven letters in chapters two and three are uh, actual letters John wrote by dictation from Jesus, which is a a rare thing. I can't think of where else we find that at all in the scriptures. But it's, hey, John, write this down. So it's kind of kind of cool. But he'll give us the the name of the church. Uh, the title of Christ specifically chosen for that church, that he wants to identify himself, himself by that title to that church. He'll give them a commendation. Um, there's a couple of churches he doesn't have a good commendation for, so he doesn't give them a commendation at all. He will offer a concern and some advice, some things to watch out for. Um, he'll offer some exhortation, which is, and when you exhort somebody, you tear them down and you build them up. So you've got some, these concerns and you want to say, you know, you're doing really good over here, but over here you need a little bit of work, so there'll be some exhortation. Keep an eye on this type of a thing. But um, in some of these, as far as having a, a concern or, or actually an exhortation about, hey, this is where you guys are messing up, um, there's a couple of churches where he doesn't have that. So a couple of churches he does not have um, a commendation of something they're really doing good. Okay, and you don't want to be one of those churches where you got nothing good to say. And then a couple of churches, he's got nothing to really exhort them over that where they're messing up. So that is where we'll go next. Let me get over to that. So any questions so far? That's to tidy up chapter one there. So when John got these letters, did the church did he did the churches get the letters? Did John give the churches? Letters, or? I uh, I am confident that John somehow was able to pass these on to a messenger. Who, the 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 order of the churches is in the order that um, a messenger will drop off a letter, and very often what will happen is is like when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians or whatever, and he sent it off to with somebody, it would go around. Um, and a church would read it. A lot of times they would copy it, and they would hand it off to somebody, to another church, and they'd go, and they might make copies of it. And then copies, people would copy it off and distribute it, and that's why we've got thousands of copies of the New Testament back in ancient days, is that it was propagated uh, and distributed broadly. Um, let me ask you a question about this, though, just something to think about, and that is, why do you think these particular churches. Any ideas? Well, they all had different struggles and strengths and stuff. And I think at some point we're all just going to heal Well, so in other words, there were other churches, like I mentioned, the the um, church at Corinth, Colossians, Colossians and all that. that yeah, why did why wasn't one of those letters to the Colossians? Yeah, why? Well, you know. <laughs> we want to know. I've been right. wondering that. So, these seven churches, seven actual churches at the time, they represent seven periods or eras in church history which is very fascinating, in order. Now, seven different types of churches and seven different types of church people. Let 
Any questions about that so far? New. Yeah, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Because it's going to be very subjective. It really is. So why these churches? Seven actual churches at the time. Seven periods or eras in church history. Seven different types of churches and seven different types of church people. <clears throat> As we said, this is just out of the way. Here's one example of that. I don't know how well you can see that. I could uh, make copies and send it to you if you want to. There are different versions of this. You can Google the Dickens out of this, and you can come up with all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. Make a copy if you can. Okay, I can do that. And then um, I, I can send it out in an email. There are different versions of it. The As far as the projected dates, the AD 30 to 100, that's pretty accurate. When you start getting up into here, middle churches and later, there'll be some slight variation on these. But we'll cover some of these and the reason why they come up to the come up with the conclusions that they do. Um, I don't understand the dates. <clears throat> now the dates are that part of it that are uh, these churches in the in the order they are given in Revelation chapter uh, two and three are written down in an order that really kind of fits the overall thrust of the church oh, okay. during that era in time in the civilized world. Okay. <clears throat> not every person in the church and not every single church, but just the overall thrust of, of uh, the movement of uh, the church. For instance, what's really clear to us more and more today, I think we can agree on, is we, we, we see so prevalent today is the Laodicean church, right? Now, Lord help us if we ever become at our church a Laodicean church, which is lukewarm. You know, not hot, not cold. Jesus says, behold, I'm at the door. I stand at the door and knock. So he's not even in the church. He said, you know, can I come in? Let me in there? It's supposed to be about me. But instead it's about the lights and all the instrumentation and the entertainment. And Jesus is standing outside knocking, going, hello. So, hey, the dogs didn't go crazy that time. That was, that was pretty bold. So that's what that's about. So I can send this on um, in email. And there's different versions of this, as I say. And um, you can get an email, and you can kind of look at it, and you can play with it a little bit and read up some more on that. But we're going to go through these churches now um, one by one we're not going to get through them all tonight but we're going to go through at least like the first three churches or something so we'll get through Ephesus, Smyrna and Pergamum in those periods a little bit you know so much church history but that doesn't matter what's going on during church history doesn't matter I think quite as much although it's interesting as it is to what it means for us spiritually on a, on a spiritual level as, as uh, individual churches and, and as individuals, okay? Um, but, you know, they'll all at least get mentioned, of course. So the first one we're going to come to is the church at Ephesus. That's the first letter. And um, that represents the entire first century church. That's, that's the church, of course, that was founded from Acts chapter 2 and all the way through um, John's time when he was on Pergamos, okay? And that's the when the church was formed and we um, all the scripture gets written, even if it's not all quite pulled together yet. So the church at, at Ephesus, let's read what the letter is there. So to the angel of the church at, of Ephesus, write, These things says... He who holds the seven stars in his right hand. We're clear who that is, right? Because we were just shown who that was in chapter 1. Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands? I know your works, 
your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they're apostles when they're not, and have found them liars, and you've persevered and have patience and have labor for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and will remove your lampstand, in other words, I'll take your church away from you, from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's spend a little, let's camp out there and spend a little time there, okay? Want, want some input on that. Let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning of this and let's break it down. And I want to do that with each of these because um, these cautions are so important for Jesus that he sat down there with John and said, hey, write this down and let's send these out. So they were made available to all of these churches at the time and every church since then, of course, in the book of Revelation has had this available. So it's important enough that Jesus came back. He'd already ascended, but he came back to talk to John and said, hey, John, I got some seven letters that I want you to take down by dictation. So let's do this, okay? Um, let's, let's look at these. So he's walking among the seven golden lampstands. So he's saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm that that person who's coming, you know, the feet of bronze and the hair of wool and all this kind of stuff. So he sounds like he's got some judgment on his mind, some discipline, right? This is, that's the way he came across, and that's how those terms were used in the first chapter and as we saw also in the Old Testament. So he says, um, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say they're apostles and have not, and have found them liars. Let's talk about that a little bit, shall we? So what do you think all that means? I don't mean necessarily details historically, but... Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I was sharing the gospel. Yeah, sharing sure the gospel. They're persecuted, yes. They're testing out the, like, being Bereans. Or... Right, they're being Bereans. So there were some people around who were calling themselves apostles and weren't. We know Paul ran into this at times, right? Where he'd go in there, Paul's not really an apostle, I am. So he ran into this. With, he ran into this at Corinth, Corinth for instance. But so uh, this happened. So you've persevered. <laughs> You have patience and you've labored for my name's sake and have not become never um, weary. So, <clears throat> nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. So, they had, they were doctrinally sound, right? Um, you know, let's let's compare our church with that since we're here. We, they were doctrinally sound. sound. They were very solid. They knew the scripture. And we can argue and say that, well, well, you know, we've got some people in this church that really know the word and really careful and care about, let's get Bible right, let's do Bible right, um, whatever else happens. But in this case, they moved away from their first love to cold academics. Um, they have all the answers right. Church polity, how churches run, they've got all that right, they've got their worship right, but yet their love has run cold. How do you think that might have come about? What what does that look like? It's sobering, isn't it? When I think of how we got our, our love in the first place and what that means, I tend to think of Again, I go back to that so many times. One of my favorite passages, Luke chapter 7, you know. Jesus is over at the Pharisee's house and the woman comes in and she anoints his 
head and his feet and dries her feet with her tears. And we find this whole lesson that the Pharisee learned and answered rightly that he who's forgiven much loves much. So your love, the love that you have, your first love, is a response to Jesus Christ, his, his suffering on the cross. And your repentance, your forgiveness, the mercy of God, God's grace on you. That's our, our first love right there, right? Our first glorious encounter with Jesus Christ that means our, uh, that demonstrates our redemption is that we fall down at him and, and uh, his mercy and for his grace because we know that we're broken, wretched sinners. And that's our first love. Something happens though where we want to get that right and we're pursuing Christ. And we can get into the scriptures, we can dig deep and we get all the answers right. And then sometimes we, we can be on, on Facebook or talking to somebody in person or in church or at work or some type of a social type uh, venue where somebody says something and it's wrong. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna set them straight. So it's easy to do that sometimes. And and um, Dr. Walter Martin used to say at times, and he's he was a, a great writer and Bible teacher on the cults. And he used to say it's very possible, and he, and um, from man's perspective, speaking from a very man's perspective type of a thing, it's very possible to win the argument and lose the soul. And we're not impossible. We're not responsible for we're winning and losing souls. That's work of the Holy Spirit. But what his point is, is that you can go after these cult members or whatever, and you've won that argument, and you really beat them up, and you've showed them, and you've taught them the deity of Christ, and you've taught them the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ha! You know, you showed them up, and they feel like, wow, that man, I just, I kind of got my tail kicked. But they, they're maybe they're bitter. After that, they felt like you were mean or you were harsh. So, Jesus, when he approached people, how did he approach them? And usually there were a couple different ways, right? Depending on who he's talking to. How did Jesus approach people when Jesus had his doctrine right? Jesus had his theology right? He had his academics right, clearly. He had all the answers. But how did he approach people? Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's the woman caught up in adultery, the woman at the well. Okay, he was loving, truthful, told them to repent. But those who are trying to work the system, the religious leaders of the day, who are in it for the business or whatever, he seemed to know who those were, you know, the, the Pharisees primarily, the Pharisees and some of the Sadducees. How did he approach them? Yeah, you brood of vipers? Yeah. Like John the Baptist, you know. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Yeah. Whitewashed tombs, right. That kind of thing. So that's the laser eyes. That's the laser eyes. That's the sword coming out of the mouth kind of a thing. That's in judgment. So um, it's possible for us to be callous sometimes to people and the way we talk to people. Uh, how can we be that way? How is how can this manifest itself? And what is the danger as far as among believers in our own church from person to person? What, what can that look like? I think we forget about the relationship with Jesus Christ. The girls and I were talking about this. You know, the Bible is a map to holiness and following God and having an intimate relationship with Him. When we instead use the map as, as um, information as knowledge instead of wisdom, then we lose the filling and the nudging and the sensitivity to the whole Okay, spirit. So we could really apply ourselves to book learning, again, the academics, but then we miss the personal relationship with yeah. Jesus Christ. But now, us losing our first love and um, losing some people in relationally in our own church, what can that look like too? And that's very true. We could do that it's very easy to do, and, and I know I've been through that kind of thing in my life. Oh, you're like the ch being legalistic. Legalistic? Yeah. That can very easily happen. we got all the right answers or whatever. We can come up with our own ledger of rules, too, can't we? Because if we want to, we can um, forget our first love, which is all about the mercy and grace of God. We can forget what Paul taught in Romans and in Galatians very well, too, but in, in Romans very well, since it's 
you know, happy Reformation Day since we, Romans and Martin Luther and his favorite book. Um, we can forget, uh, as Paul told the Jews of, in that letter, that the law is not meant to be uh, legalistically kind of obeyed as a system to get to heaven and an accountability to hold each other to. The purpose of the law is to show us our need for the Savior and that which creates us as enemies from God, which creates enmity with God. So we're separated from God, and that's the point of the law. They say, well, I'm, I'm done then. I can't, you know, even if I sin, I can't undo what I've done, and I can't do the stuff I should have done that I didn't. I'm doomed. So that was the point of the law. And that's our first love, is it brings us to Jesus Christ saying, I need a Redeemer, I need the Savior. Um, I need salvation. And But the, yet at the same time, the story I just told in Luke, where he told the story about the debtor, and, and one was in for, you know, I don't remember the numbers now, 500 in an area, and the other one, you know, okay, so one was forgiven for one amount, and one's forgiven for the other, and one didn't forgive the as soon as he got out of prison, he got out of debtor's prison. What did he do? He, go, he, saw, he sees a guy, a buddy over here who owes him 10. And says, where's my money? Okay. We can be like that and we can hold each other to account in the law again. And go back to the law. And we can say, I don't think, you know, I don't think, you know, the cut of your coat should be that way or your hair should be that way. I don't think, you know, your suit should be that way and your skirt definitely should not be that way. And you, your hair is the wrong length and it's the wrong color. And it's too many colors. And what's with all the, your earrings? The bobbles on your earrings are too big or maybe they're too small. So we can introduce all kinds of legalism into the church that, and forget our first love. And that is we're supposed to love each other as Christ loved the church. And we're supposed to show mercy to each other. And not hold each other to account like that. That misses the whole point of what our first love is, right? To love each other just as Christ loved us. So we want to make sure that we never never do that as a, as a church and as individuals. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to a church like that or spent much time there, but it's oppressive. It's really oppressive. And um, uh, it can... It can you can feel struggle and depression like you could never catch up with where the expectation is that you should be with God because the pastor says you should be here and these people say you should. And so that leaves you outside of this certain group so you're not in this inner circle over here. It, it creates all kinds of weird, odd things that are just not healthy for church at all. So it's a cautionary tale for us to not not do that. If we're getting it right and we're getting our doctor and I, let's... We're getting our doctrine right. Let's not forget our first love, which is pursuit of Christ, and to share that love, multiply the love of Christ to one another. So that whether it's to, to believers or to the other members of the church, all same, same, right? Questions, comments about that? Have you been through any of that before? A little bit? Like a legalistic church, a really... Harsh. No, but I remember my mother and father in law years ago, they were not Christians, and then all of a sudden one day they became Christians. We weren't living near them, so I don't know how it happened, but they were going to a church. They lived out, out in the desert in Victorville, and the, my mother in law wore jeans and t shirts and stuff like that, and all of a sudden they go to this church where, oh, well, we have to wear dresses all the time, and the women aren't allowed to keep their hair short. And I looked at her, I go, are you going to do that? And she says, well, no, I'm going to keep my hair short. I mean, she, she, they're going to a church, those are the rules, but she already knew she wasn't going to follow the rules. Yeah. So I don't know if they ended up changing the church. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why we should subject ourselves today to you when, when Christ doesn't. And here's the thing, too, is that there's like willful disobedience and we can disagree. This is, this is where, you know, and we can have this discussion because this, this video might end up on the internet or whatever, but we can have this discussion because it'll be out there and we run into this. And that is that when, when do you run into this at a church and when is the, how do you approach a pastor who pastors this kind of a church and how do you handle this type of a situation? Uh, 
you know, and what is the right way to air it. And obviously there's going to be, if you go to, to a pastor who pastors this kind of church, he's going to have loaded up in his backpack all kinds of pet Bible passages and verses that he feels really solid and sure on. And he's going to support that and say, no, the scripture says this, so I'm going to believe it this way. And then, you know, probably out of context, whatever else, but that's okay because it supports what he's saying in his position, so he's going to stick with that. So, so do you stay to the church in rebellion? Do you go along with it? Do you break off from that church? What does that look like? Have you ever thought of that type of a situation? I hope you never run into that, first of all, but I guarantee you, put this on the internet, some people are going through that now, and, or will someday. What would you do in that situation? I think the first question would be to ask, um, like for scripture, like, what are their reasoning, like, what are their scripture? Okay, to... so first question is talk to the pastor, pull him aside probably privately, not in front of everybody and get in his face, but in love. What scriptures are you, you know, because, wow, about some things he might be right. Okay, but about some of the stuff, though, that he's right about, something I want you to have in the back of your mind, though, is that all the law that the Pharisees had in mind, the burdens that they used to put on people in that day, that Jesus shook his finger at them for or yelled at them for or whatever, they were correct about a lot of those things they are in the law. Uh, a lot of the things, though, were laws that, that were introduced after that their own little rules and things like that. So the law it comes down to the law. Are we really expected, this, you know, okay, you have this passage here about this law in Leviticus, whatever. Does that, I mean, does that mean we, what does that mean? You know, so we have these questions here. So how do you, so he's got these verses he shares them with you, and then what do you, and, and he shares them with you, and then what? Research it, pray about it. Yeah, I mean, because there might be something in there that he's correct about. But at the same time, man looks at the outward and God looks at the heart, right? Isn't that what we find in the scriptures? And far too often that's the case, is that we're holding each other to this, these certain physical standards or whatever. If somebody's living in outright rebellion and and they're just being disrespectful or whatever. I mean, you pray for people. Um, sometimes people come to church. A lot of times they don't know the Lord or they're immature in the Lord and they come to church dressed the wrong way, you know? Um, sometimes a lot of those people, they have, to me, it's, it's profane in a way to, you're getting up, up there on the platform I'm not going to call it an altar because nothing's being sacrificed there or anything, but you know, you're getting up on the platform and you're leading the congregation into worship and you're wearing flip-flops or sandals and shorts and you're dressed like you don't care. You're representing the king of kings, lord of lords. That's kind of profane. Now you can go too far, you know, probably, and especially try to draw attention to yourselves and sometimes it can be too dressed up, or it can be the roll with the sash and the whatever to call attention, hey, everybody look at me. And those are all heart issues, and the Lord knows where those are. Not everybody who dresses that way is wrong, too. The noob who is new in Christ but just wants to serve and get up there and play the guitar, and he doesn't know what he's doing, but he just wants to praise the Lord. Whew, he came to Jesus, you know, two months ago. Okay, so he doesn't know any better, and he's wearing cutoffs, and you're going, oh, you've hey, you know. But those are where you have these gentle conversations, right? So we show one another love, and there's a right way to approach situations and a wrong way to approach situations. So we just want to always have those in mind and be very loving, okay? And, and I think to that pastor, too, we want to do the same kind of a thing. But I think if you get to a point where um, it becomes more than just a distraction and a burden too grievous to bear, um as far as some of the requirements, and it becomes too legalistic to the point where it's uh, not really pointing to Christ so much, but it's pointing to a rigidity in law, 
like the Pharisees used to hold people to in the New Testament days, it might be time to perfectly step away. And I don't encourage church hopping, you know, that kind of thing. I never want to encourage that. But there comes a time when you got to pray and you got to have a heart-to-heart -heart with the Lord and, and, and decide what to do. Okay, and you seek wise counsel from other believers. You count the cost, right? Mm -hmm. And you make your decision. So, so he says, remember therefore where you have fallen, repent and do the first work. So remember where you've fallen. And I think that also can mean remember where you've fallen from. In other words, before you abuse people with all these, this tough, rigid, academic type of doctrinally, theologically correct rigidity, Remember that you were, at one point, you didn't have all the answers either. When you go before, you get called to heaven, um, St. Peter's not going to be standing there, and he's not going to be standing there with a the clipboard and having forcing people to take a quiz on whether their doctrine's right or not before he's going to let them into heaven. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. I, I knew next to nothing when I came to Christ. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I did not have all the doctrine right. I couldn't have told you a trinity from a Twinkie, you know, but we, the Lord looks at the heart, and the Lord knows where, where you need. Yeah, I think there's also a difference between, like, personal conviction and then legalism of, like, trying to get into heaven. Personal conviction versus legalism, yeah. yeah. And so, like, you know, if, if there was a church that said, like, you know, people at the church can't go to movie theaters. Okay, yeah, and, movie theater, yeah, and, can't go and, see movies. And, yeah, and that would be different from someone, you know, personally saying, well, you know, I think, I think it would be better if I don't, I'm going to make, you know, I think it would be better, more glorifying to God if I don't go to a movie theater, you know, that doesn't mean other people can't, but per, I'm going to make that. Imposing that on other people as opposed to personal convictions mm -hmm. kind of a thing, yeah. And those are all Holy Spirit type of issues because, you know, there, most movies today you can't hardly go to. I mean, it's it's really, you can't hardly watch a movie, a TV or anything, TV show or anything now where they're not imposing LGBTQEIEIO on you and every time you turn around, it's, you know, this, and you're, okay, I'm out of here. This was, okay, this, just tell me a story, you know? But instead, what they want to do is they want to impose worldly stuff and so we shouldn't be partaking in that kind of thing and, and uh, it's profane. And what does that do with our spiritual growth to spend time in that? So, yeah, no, that's very true. So a lot of those things are personal convictions. And we pray for others who aren't convicted by it, but maybe they should be. And, but that's, again, that's Holy Spirit work. And so and those are some good insights. Okay, so he says in, in verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to him to uh, eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, let's let's take a quick look at that. Um, this is mentioned in a couple places. Turn to um, Genesis chapter 2, real quick. I know there's a, a verse here that's actually not on a slide. Well, I know from the, I know, but that's okay. We're going to end up back at the end again. To what? To, to be or not to be. Now, that's two not nine. You're not a question. That's the question. That's the question, yeah. All right. Um, da -da -da -da. And out of the ground, in verse 9, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there are two very key trees that we've we read about in scripture before. What was years? I had read Genesis a million gazillion times about a year ago. I read it and I never noticed there were two trees before. Two trees. I was stuck on, you know, they, they were forbidden from one but yeah, I never yeah. eaten it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, two different two different ones. Hop, hop over. <laughs> flip the verse. Flip, flip the verse. Flip the page over to chapter three. Let's start with verse twenty-one. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. 
Then look at this verse in verse 22. Look at this next. This is really interesting. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Except he knew it on a first-hand level. Not as much as God, of course. We can't know anything much as God does. But, you know, the man became aware from experientially in a bad way to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed the cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and uh, a flaming sword which turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life. So Adam and Eve, I mean, wow, having sinned and they were now enemies of God, Somehow there's this tree, this tree of life that he could have, they could have eaten from and they would have eternal physical life at least forever and ever from that tree. So permanent enemies of God, not, I mean, what kind of torture would that be before they, what would redemption look like? So that's something to ponder and think about, but evidently there was that kind of a dynamic going on, which is a, a very odd kind of thing. But we see it again, again, we're going from one end of the, of the Bible to the other. Um, all the way to the, the back in Revelation 22. Pastor Greg pointed out this morning too, talking about it, and there's another example of it, and it's, there's also the book of life at the end of Revelation 2. I'll let you study that one on your own, or just wait till we get there at some point, because eventually, many weeks from now, we'll be in the end of Revelation, or in a year, I don't know when it's going to be. Um, Let's see, start with verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of, of um, water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and out uh, and of the Lamb in the middle of the street and on either side of the river and the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Okay, now let's stop right there just a second. Now this is what he's describing here. If you go back... Um, Remember I talked about context and sometimes you've got to go back a little bit before. So go back to the previous chapter and starting in chapter 22, you see he's talking about New Jerusalem, which is the big cube shaped thing that uh, is the future home of the bride of Christ, the church. So it's a special room edition that God says, um, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's uh, mansion or many rooms, this kind of thing. This is what he's talking about here. So this is New Jerusalem. So a tree of life is going to be in the midst of it, but evidently it's not just one tree. It's several trees. So it's like you have the walnut tree, you have the cedar tree, and you have the tree of life. And there's several of them, and they've got um, several different types of, of fruit on them, uh, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree um, were for the healing of the nations. What does that mean? Can I think about when this is? So we're talking about during the millennium. And we have to remember that when we get to the end of the tribulation. Is it the 12 tribes? And when they go into the millennium? Well, it will be more than just that. What happens at the, the tribulation period, we've got, we start off with all unbelievers because the church of Jesus Christ has been raptured. All unbelievers. At some point, people start believing. I mean, it might happen from people sitting there watching the rapture, watching people disappear or float up or whatever that looks like. We don't know for sure, but we know we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and that we ascend into heaven. Now, when Jesus ascended, it wasn't all of a sudden the disciples said, what, where'd he go? They were watching and they go, what? And the angel said, we're going to stand here all day, staring up into the heavens. He's going to come back the way, you know. He... So go about your work. The angels had to run him off. We don't know what exactly it's going to look like. It's going to be glorious and funny the way. So that might happen, and they might that would cause me to repent, I think. Okay, but we're also going to have two witnesses, the 144,000. We're going to have all kinds of events and things happening, books left behind, videos left behind, personal messages left behind. People are going to repent. Some people are going to come to know Christ. The gospel is going to be shared. We're going to end up with believers. We're going to end up with, with tribulation saints in here. And you're going to end up with by the middle of the tribulation period when the false messiah, the antichrist, which really should just be called a pseudo-christ, a fake Christ, 
stands up in the temple, desecrates the temples, and, and all that kind of, they're going to wake up and go, oh, hey, hey, this isn't our Messiah. This guy's, they were right. The two witnesses were right, the 144,000. It really was Jesus. This guy's a fake. Nobody would, the real Messiah wouldn't do this in the temple and demand worship in the temple of an image. It really was Jesus. So you're going to see huge conversion of Jews at this point and remnant of Jews, okay? And then you get to the end of the tribulation. So there's going to be judgment and there's going to be Matthew 25, the second half, or part two, the sequel to the Olivet Discourse, separation of the sheep and the goats, sheep and goats judgment. So the goats go off into outer darkness to await the great white throne judgment. Only believers go into the millennium period, the thousand year reign of Christ, okay? So what we've got here is we've got New Jerusalem, we've got only believers, but you know what? They're mortals, a bunch of mortals in the millennial period. So coming back to Revelation 22, which you've got here with New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem comes down, and on the earth you're going to have a bunch of mortals, uh, believers. So they're, it's because they're mortals, I guess they can get sick occasionally or stub their toe or whatever. Okay? Swing a hole, hit their foot, ouch, I got a gash here. So this tells us that these are for the healing of the nations, and I think the nations are all the nations. Gentiles, Israel, uh, all, all the nations in the world. Egypt is going to have a prominent role. So th that's going to be what this is for. So evidently, it, since it's in New Jerusalem, you know, we're going to have healing skills. Sometimes healer will be able to go grab some herbs and stuff like that, come down to the earth and, and apply medicines to people. Interesting, right? And people get sick. So also look down at verse... Yeah, still chapter 22. We'd look at 21 to verify that it was um, New Jerusalem. Go down to 2214. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside, because by this time, you know, there could be, you know, these mortal believers will have kids and stuff and not all the kids will be believers. Outside are dogs and sorcerers or pharmakeia, which means drug abusers, sexual, sexually immoral, murderers, adulterers, whoever loves and practices lies. So sin will rise up again and, and the Lord will let it have its peak toward the end of the millennium. And this is we see Satan's been bound for a thousand years. Man has nobody to blame and say, the devil made me do it. Like Flip Wilson used to say, the comedian from back in the 70s. We won't be able to say that anymore and blame it on demons and blame it on the devil. Man will still be sinning. He has no one to blame, no one to thank but himself for his own fall. And um, then will come the final judgment. But, so that's what the, the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. So we're going to stop. We, we got into exactly one church, but I think a good discussion. We finished up chapter one. Yeah, any more questions or comments about that, thoughts about that? The first church was, you know, rounds out to be um, around the year 100, and and then we go into another church um, where there's persecution because remember it wasn't long afterwards. Persecution was already picking up um, during John's day was Domitian, and they were even spreading the rumor at the time that uh, Christians were cannibals, and eating, you know we were cannibals. We were the ones who started the fire back in 70 A.D. and Blame all, they're blaming the Christians, but the reason why they thought we were cannibals is because of communion, Lord's Supper, this is the body, this is his blood. And they thought, well, they're, they even spread the rumor that where did they get that blood? Where did they get the flesh? Oh, babies, they're killing babies. So Christians are baby killers. So they started all this type of weird rumors and things back in those days. And that helped to spur on the persecution against the saints at the time. From some time up until AD 100. About 100, yeah. And, it, and then we, we go into the next church. So we'll pick up at Smyrna, the, the church and persecution um, next time, next session, the persecuted church. And we'll talk about that a little bit, what some of those characteristics are. And I think some of these characteristics of churches are really good cautionary tales for all of us to kind of look at in ourselves as individuals, beyond just what our church that we attend might be like. So, any more?
All right, with that, we'll wrap it up. Let's close real quick in prayer, okay? Lord, thank you so much for um, healthy and rigorous discussion. Thank you so much for what you show us in your word. Thank you for the cautionary tales that you give us in these epistles to the seven churches. And Lord, we pray that you would um, help us to be ready um, always, Lord, to serve you and to be on guard against the... Um, things that these churches are exhorted against and to look forward to the commendations, the things that you promised for us like uh, access to the tree of life at some point and also living in the holy city, the new Jerusalem someday. Lord, we so look forward to all these things and we look forward to the next Bible study where we can get into um, a couple more churches or more. And uh, we just... Look forward to serving you and learning more about you in this upcoming week, Lord. May we keep our eyes on Christ, for it's in your name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.